Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first alumni virtual reading series session of this academic year. And we're delighted to have with us alum Stuart Fellow, Daron Wallace, to speak about his book, The Culture Trap, Ethnic Expectations and Unequal Schooling for Black Youth. And we are also honored to have Joshua Bennett as our discussant an Associate Professor of Sociology and Education at Brandeis University. Deron Wallace is a cultural sociologist of race, ethnicity, and education. He has been the recipient of a fellowship from the University of Manchester, of a Fulbright Scholar Award, and a National Academy of Education Spencer Postdoctoral Fellowship. Previously, he worked as a community organizer with Citizens UK, as a special assistant to the Minister of Education in Rwanda, as a consultant with local educational authorities in London, and as a national director at the Posse Foundation in the US. Raised in a working class community in Jamaica, Duran received his PhD from the University of Cambridge, where he was a British Marshall Scholar and a Gates Cambridge Scholar. His new book is The Culture Trap, Ethnic Expectations and Unequal Schooling for Black Youth, published by Oxford University Press, and we will be hearing more about this today. The discussant Joshua Bennett is the author of books, many books of poetry, criticism, and narrative nonfiction. He is professor and distinguished chair of the humanities at MIT. His volume, The Sobbing School, was winner of the National Poetry Series and a finalist for an NAACP Image Award. His book of criticism, Being Property Once Myself, earned the MLA's William Sanders Scarborough Prize. His other works include Ode and the Study of Human Life. And just this year, Spoken Word, A Cultural History was published with Jesse McCarthy. He's the founding co-editor of Minor Notes, a Penguin Classics book series dedicated to minor poets with the Black expressive tradition. Joshua Bennett earned his PhD in English from Princeton and an MA in Theater Performance Studies from the University of Warwick. He has received fellowships and awards from, among other places, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Society of Fellows at Harvard University. Thank you both for being here today. Deron Wallace will read from his book. Joshua Bennett will engage in conversation. And the final 20 minutes of the hour will be reserved for Q&A with the audience. Thank you, audience members, for joining us. And would you please begin, Deron? Let me start first with gratitude. Um, gratitude for my family, without whom um, this book would not be what it is. Um, I want to name them. Um, my wife, Dania, my mom, my dad, and my children brothers, sisters, cousins. Um, this is part of my ethic, um, is to think about family in relation to the work. The work, to me, at, very, at the very least, means nothing without them. I must also acknowledge and thank those of you in this space. Thank you so much for choosing um, to join us today from so many different parts of the world. Um, to my brother, friend, and colleague, Josh, thank you, too, for agreeing to being in conversation with me um, today. I'm delighted to share with you all some extracts from my book, um, The Culture Trap. I'll read today from the preface um, very briefly before segueing into um, an audiovisual project inspired by my son. <laughs> Immediately thereafter, I'll continue reading, and then Josh and I will engage um, in conversation. And so to the preface. Although it was morning, the dreary London sky suggested otherwise. The gray all around seemed to dull the red double-decker bus I boarded in Brixton, heading to a primary school in another part of South London. During the 40-minute journey, I pressed my head against the window on the upper deck and observed the changing landscape beyond it. From the rows of Victorian terraced houses with big bay windows, the evergreen trees, evergreen trees swaying in the breeze, the rubbish bins lying on their backs along the pavement, to the multi-story blocks of flats, towering over convenience stores and food stalls, the police officers striding up and down the road, and the teenagers alighting at bus stops en route to school. In time, I hopped off the bus and rushed down through the road to see students I had worked with for nearly a year in my capacity as a community organizer, young people of Caribbean, 
African, Asian, European, and multi-ethnic heritage who reflect Britain's new diversity. When I arrived at the school, a black teacher with salt and pepper hair parted and plaited with a timeless arithmetic welcomed me with a warm embrace. My exchange with Miss Bell exposed me to a diaspora dilemma and forced me to consider how culture shapes students' success or failure in schools, or at the very least, to question it. To tell you more about the impetus for this project, I wish to debut now my book trailer, after which I will continue reading. Tom, over to you. Have you ever wondered about how culture shapes students' success or failure in schools? I have. My journey to find answers to this complex but seemingly simple question began years ago on what seemed an otherwise ordinary winter morning in South London. That day, the frost in the air was plain to see if you uttered but a word. The chill of the crisp morning breeze brought warmth to the hearts of some, smiling, strolling, and scurrying by. At least, so it seemed. This otherwise ordinary morning led to an extraordinary moment when I arrived at a local primary school to see students I had worked with for nearly a year on a street safety campaign. A black teacher with salt and pepper hair I call Miss Bell welcomed me with a warm embrace. Miss Bell reminded me, as she always did, that she has been teaching for as long as I have been alive. On our way up the stairs to her class, Miss Bell asked about my work. I told her, among many, many other things, that I studied at the University of Cambridge. And you're Caribbean? She asked with an unmistakably sharp Jamaican accent as she spun around with knitted brows, squinted eyes, and that look my mother gives me if I dare tell a lie in her hearing. I responded in the affirmative, and for what felt like all too long, Miss Bell searched my face intently, as if in disbelief. Caribbean people don't get into Cambridge, she continued. Africans, maybe, she said, but not Caribbean young people. I slowed my strides. In the US, Caribbean people usually do well, I said. Miss Bell took me by my hand, pointed down the hall toward her classroom, and said, Not in England, my friend. An awkward silence followed us down the hallway until a group of eight to nine-year-olds shouted, Mr. Wallace! Mr. Wallace! As I stepped into the classroom, I couldn't help but wonder if Miss Bell's perceptions were true. When I next met Miss Bell, this time outside of a church, where she co-directed a Saturday supplementary school, she seemed perplexed by our previous conversation too. Is what you told me about Caribbean people in the US really a thing? She asked, confessing that she had never heard claims of Caribbean success in the United States. She wondered aloud, what caused Caribbean people to be successful there and not here? I insisted that Caribbean success in the United States was not universal but contextual at best. I told Miss Bell that in cities like New York, black Caribbean people developed and defended a reputation of being hardworking and committed to education, all in pursuit of the American dream. I then questioned her about Caribbean disadvantage in Britain and its causes. They keep talking about what's bad about Caribbean culture and Caribbean people, she said. But how could it be our culture when people with Caribbean culture have different results in different countries? I asked. At that me I wonder, Miss Bell replied. This cultural dilemma captivated me. Something about the curious paradox of Caribbean achievement gave me clarity and sparked restless curiosity. This book, The Culture Trap, Ethnic Expectations and Unequal Schooling for Black Youth, is the result of that moving, memorable exchange with Miss Bell 
It is my answer to looming questions about the role of culture in shaping students' educational achievement. What I learned is that the use of culture to explain black students' success or failure in schools is not only tricky, it is a trap. Thank you for your time and attention. This ethnography is centrally concerned with a perplexing paradox among Black Caribbean youth in British and American society, which has been shaped discursively and comparatively from the early 20th century to present. Since the 1920s, Black Caribbean people in the United States have been considered a high achieving Black model minority. In contrast, since the 1950s, Black Caribbean people in Britain have been regarded as a chronically underachieving minority. In both national contexts, however, it is often suggested that Caribbean culture informs their status, whether as a celebrated or degraded group. This book reveals the relationship between race and culture in education within and beyond national particularities, highlights the connections between narratives of culture and histories of structural inequality, and points to new possibilities for equity and justice in and outside of schools. For Black Caribbean people on both sides of the Atlantic, the confluence of culture, class, and context in nations with peculiar racial histories of slavery and colonialism informs their differing experiences and expectations of Black Caribbean youth. How ethno-racial groups like Black Caribbeans reimagine, articulate, and practice cultures is contingent on their situated contexts and their positions within them. Moreover, the specific cultural strategies ethnocultural groups or ethno-racial groups marshal to signify their status are informed by their structural positions and so social circumstances in that host society. These nuances are often elided in public and educational discourses. But these complex perspectives are necessary for challenging the preponderance of cultural claims in schools that neglect the variation within groups and promote a fixed formula about which groups achieve and why. Over-reliance on and oversimplification of ethnic cultures to explain success or failure is a trap. This ethnography explores the significance of what I call the culture trap for Black Caribbean young people in London and New York in two different but related ways. I define the culture trap as an alluring yet ensnaring set of logics that draws on ethnic culture to decipher ethno-racial minority student success, but instead distorts and misrepresents it. The culture trap treats ethnic culture as a group's description and prescription. I unpack these and related points in the culture trap. I illuminate ethnic expectations as routine forms of the culture trap that teachers, parents, and Black Caribbean youth reinforce directly and indirectly in schools. That grim gray day when Miss Bell met me at the school gate will forever be etched into my consciousness as a moment of deep intellectual awakening. Her comments and questions ushered my mind down a previously unfamiliar corridor and motivated this comparative ethnography. Were Miss Bell's assertions correct? Were mine? More importantly, how can popular perceptions of Black Caribbean students' achievement help hinder or harm students like those who greeted me with bright, broad smiles at the entrance of Miss Bell's classroom. This ethnography provides critical and original perspectives to elucidate a complex cultural and structural phenomenon. Amidst ongoing discussions about racial inequalities in education and institutional racism in British and American schools, 
This ethnography points to the urgent need to challenge the conscious and unconscious cultural assumptions that teachers, school leaders, parents, and pupils at times use to assess students' success. And now to the introduction, at least a part of it. I want you to understand how young people experience the culture trap. So permit me at least a few more minutes. No one expected such a hot April day in New York City, at least not so soon. Time seemed to crawl when the sudden sweltering heat drove away the cool of spring. I wished for a gush of rain to waft cool air through the open window into the muggy classroom at Newlands High, where I sat with 24 teenagers studying American literature. From the back of Mr. Sterling's 10th grade honors English class, I watched a few students fashion makeshift paper fans while others rested their heads. Some wrote feverishly. A couple took notes slowly with one hand, dangling the other from their desk. Yo, mister, Tom said. When are we gonna get AC in class that the principal and teachers got in the office? Mr. Sterling, a veteran white teacher, ignored Tom, a usually provocative voice among his peers known for his wisecracks and defensive skills on the soccer field. Or if you're in Britain, the football field. <laughs> Mr. Yo, Mr. Tom continued, it's hot as hell in here. Turn on the AC, man. You'll get AC when you get A's instead of C's, Mr. Sterling replied. Oh, students said in swelling, in swelling unison. Don't worry about my C's, mister. Worry about that river running from them pits you got. Oh, students said again. I chuckled to myself. A good rebuttal never loses its power. Mr. Sterling warned the class that one more outburst would be followed by a pop quiz. In due time, the room fell silent. I just can't understand, Mr. Sterling continued, why other West Indians or Black Caribbean kids are getting A's and B's in my class, and you're here with C's and D's being a nuisance. C ain't a bad grade, Mr. Tom said in hushed tones. It is if you're Caribbean. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. During my time as a student at a large New York City public school, I heard teachers express high expectations of Black Caribbean students, but not so publicly or so punitively. You are capable of more, Sterling added. The other West Indian children are smart and you are too. Your mother told me not to let you settle. You know how to work harder. Tom sucked his teeth, stood up, snatched the pass from Mr. Sterling's desk, walked out, walked out of the room and slammed at the door. I wish this were the only time I witnessed such an exchange at Newlands High School, but it was not. Most encounters between white teachers and Black Caribbean students that I observed were not like what Tom experienced with Mr. Sterling, but for Tom and his peers, explicit and implicit beliefs about Caribbean students' exceptional capacity for high achievement and hard work were all too familiar. Thousands of miles on the other side of the Atlantic or across the Atlantic, in a leafy section of South London with mature oak trees and neatly manicured grass, Caribbean students wrestled with weighty yet quite different expectations of their capacity for achievement. One encounter made this particularly clear. On an unseasonably warm day at Londonville Secondary School in South London, Akila approached Miss James, a white English language teacher, about the 54% scribbled in green at the top of her mock exam. The Black Caribbean year 10 student was known as a studious leader with a knack for reading, literary criticism, and debate. With a key assignment a few days away, Akila found herself panicking about the lowest grade she had received since the start of the school year. When she saw me talking with Miss James in the stairwell, Akila pulled her perm into a ponytail, straightened her tie, and cleared her throat. Excuse me, she said as she approached. Miss James, can I talk to you about my last exam? I pretty much failed. Sure, Miss James said. Why don't you come by the staff room during lunch? I will, Miss. It's just that I'm not used to this kind of grade, and so many people did well. Akila's voice trembled and cracked. Miss James patted Akila on the back. Don't worry, she said. Don't worry. Remember, this is just one exam. You're already exceeding expectations. I don't understand, Miss. How come I'm exceeding expectations when I pretty much failed the exam? What Miss James said in response left Akila confused and disturbed. Most students don't do as well as you, Akila. Other Caribbean students don't do as well as you. Akila furrowed her brow. I squinted my eyes. And what is that supposed to mean, Miss? Akila asked politely. It's a compliment, Miss James replied. 
you're a very good student, Akila. Having worked in several London primary and secondary schools as a community organizer, I had grown, grown accustomed to subtle, underhanded, yet seemingly well-meaning comments about Black Caribbean students underachieving and misbehaving. But this candid exchange between Akila and Miss James took the cake and the biscuit, Akila explained later. It was a moment of remarkable clarity about the low educational expectations Black Caribbean students faced at, school, at schools like Lunderville. Stop by the staff room at lunchtime, Miss James said. Akila agreed. After Akila walked away, I couldn't help but seek clarification from Miss James about what seemed like low expectations for Akila and her Caribbean peers, a common pattern in British schools, particularly among white teachers like Miss James. We have high expectations of all our students, Mr. Wallace, but not everyone can meet them. Caribbean students in particular struggle to do so. This was true when I was in secondary school, and it's still true now. Miss James' comments shocked me, as only two weeks earlier, standing in the same stairwell, she had told me that, and I quote, we must believe in all our young people no matter their background, end of quote. What Ms. James said to Akila seemed a contradiction between ideal aspirations and everyday expectations. Akila's encounter with Ms. James and Tom's in London and Tom's encounter with Mr. Sterling in New York City are emblematic of the contrasting educational expectations of Black Caribbean young people navigating the education systems in two different institutional, geographical, and political contexts. These examples epitomize numerous moments in education when teachers and students are caught in what I call the culture trap, instances in which loose understandings of ethnic culture distort perceptions of students' achievement. Frequent casual commentary on Black Caribbean students' potential and performance shaped their experiences at Newlands High in New York City and Londonville Secondary in London. These judgments were often so naturalized and normative that they remained largely unquestioned and unchallenged. I call these assumptions about students' prospects for achievement based on their cultural heritage, ethnic expectations, consequential expressions of the culture trap. Now, to learn more about the culture trap and ethnic expectations, I can't help but urge you to get a copy of the book and to read it closely to understand how the culture trap is in fact a formulation specific to Black Caribbeans in London and New York City, yes, or inspired by them, but it's not exclusive to them. As I argue in this book, and I'm going off script here, that the model minority thesis often used to frame particular group of, groups of Asians, though not exclusively, in both London and New York City or Britain and the United States is an expression of the culture trap. The culture of poverty thesis long used to sort of demote um, and undermine the experiences, misrepresent the experiences of African-Americans in the United States and Black Caribbeans in Britain, that too is an expression of the culture trap. But there's another feature of the culture trap that I'm arguing in this book, and that is ethnic expectations. And I urge you to read this book to learn more. I thank you so much for your time and attention, and I yield the floor to you now, my friend and colleague, Joshua Bennett. That is fantastic. We just have a round of applause, silently or otherwise, for Duran. Oh, it's gorgeous. And I know your your publisher is somewhere standing up clapping right now, too. That pitch at the end was was perfect and uh, well placed. Brother, thank you so much for sharing the, the great shining gift of this book. It's helped me so much uh, for reasons that we've talked about already as an educator, as a parent, and also as someone who went to an independent school in New York City where ethnic expectations were rampant, uh, especially among a diverse kind of population of, of Black students that we saw there were differential expectations of the, the students you know, who were first generation from West Africa, the Caribbean, and the Black American students. So I was wondering if you could first start to talk a bit about the, the functionality of the, the culture trap and its breadth. So who does the culture uh, trap and snare and how? Can you talk a little bit, a bit about that? Can you talk about students in ways that are fantastic? But in this book, you know, you have members of the, the ministry, right? You got a pastor in there, you have parents, you have teachers. So can you talk a bit about the differential effects of, of the culture trap and how those different populations navigate it? 
Thank you so much for that question, Josh, and delighted to be in conversation with you. Um, I argue in this work that we all are susceptible to the culture trap. That is the direct answer. When we submit to loose logics that overestimate the influence of culture in shaping the success or failure of students in schools, whether we be parents, teachers, school leaders, members of the clergy, policymakers, we are falling into the culture trap. In this book, I try to make clear how students experience the culture trap, how teachers themselves are often falling into the culture trap while also pulling students into the culture trap. But critically, I show you, particularly in the latter part of the book, how Black youth resist the culture trap, right? That they're not simply um, encountering this without discernment, without um, savvy. That if there's anything I've learned from this book is that young people, Black young people in particular, are savvy political actors, whether or not they have the vote. And even in their schools, they're able to negotiate power and negotiate who falls into the culture trap when and where. It's a human story. Um, Joshua, I, I don't think there's anybody who, um, we can all, we are all susceptible to it. It's not um, just about what happens with white teachers, though disproportionately, I did see in both these schools, white teachers investing tremendous stock. They didn't call it the culture trap, but tremendous stock in sort of elevating culture as the rhyme or reason for success or failure, or as one person called it, the secret sauce. Right. There's deep investment in this in our policy and political narratives about why students achieve. We see this in debates about um, specialized high schools, um, be it in, in, in New York City that I'm familiar with or even in Boston. That's very local to us. Um, and so we, we see a resurgence of sort of dominant discussions around culture. In the UK context more recently, there was a, um, uh, a pretty significant report led by the government in which, you know, uh, one of the key claims was that um, uh, relative to its other European peers, um, Britain had um, made significant strides in being anti-racist, right? That race was, uh, you know, no longer a significant issue. Um, and that the only groups that were really struggling with this um, uh, and remain underachieving are Black Caribbeans, right? And, you know, gesturing towards their culture, family composition, this narrative that those of us who are critical of sort of mid 20th century um, uh, Black history would be mindful of as being relevant to the framing of African Americans here in the United States. I share a range of those examples to make it really clear to elucidate the point that we're all susceptible in schools, outside of schools, in the policy arena, and even in our home. Even the pastor who invited me to work with these young people in this Black supplementary school often lifted up in London this narrative of Caribbeans being underachieving as being the reason they needed to forge ahead. On one hand, I understand why he did that, but in so doing, he's reinforcing that very narrative itself. Yes. Right? Um, and so we are all susceptible to the culture trap. And I use the case of Black Caribbeans to illuminate a larger point about how a whole host of ethnocultural groups find themselves susceptible to and falling into the culture trap. That's fantastic. I want to linger there, too, on this note of, uh, of resistance. What sort of solidarities did you perceive, both in your time as an organizer and also while writing this book, between these various ethnic groups in the student body that are narratively being positioned against each other? What did you yeah. see there at the level of collaboration? Sure. So um, the direct answer to that is that the greatest forms of solidarity were forged when Black youth were commonly proximate to the problem. Mm. So the clearest example of this what had to do with what happened outside of the school, which leads me to my next book project. What happens when these black young people experience the police in outside of schools and they don't care if they're African, they don't care if they're African-American and they don't care if they're black British or if they're Caribbean. Those were moments of profound solidarity. Relatedly, however, I noted um, that um, amongst the students in schools, they would collaborate. The Black African students would, you know, stand up for the Caribbean students when in terms where the teacher was using our culture against us. Why? Because they recognize that too for the Black African students, the Nigerian and Ghanaian students in particular, recognize that as a threat to themselves as well, right? Um, what was challenging, however, were the slippages, the moments where that solidarity was not sustained. And what we find is that um, for, and I can elaborate on this later on, but for Black Caribbeans in, uh, in London, who have long been a stigmatized group, um, they're, one of the strategies they practice is what I call distinctiveness. And in London, where they've experienced considerable stigmatization as a collective group, 
individual high achieving Black Caribbean students practice what I call individual distinctiveness. They would say, even relative to their own ethno or cultural group, I am not like those Caribbean young people, or I'm not like these Yadis. Relatedly, however, in, 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 um, in New York, Black Caribbeans who were often celebrated as you know, this model group, even though only a few of them were really high achieving in the school, they celebrated this um, uh, degree of success as a representation of the collective. They practice what I call collective distinctiveness. We did that. When, when, when the student walks through the hallway and she's ranked third in the graduating class, these Caribbean students are cheering and they're saying, we did that. When, no, she did that. And there are reasons she did that, right? This leads me to my final point. What I note on both sides of the Atlantic is that the high achieving students, both in London and New York City, were disproportionately black middle class students. What I'm arguing is there that there are a range of class resources that aids in the advancement of student success and their representation of it. The reason this is tethered so much to the culture trap is because um, what, what we see with the culture trap is what I call the secret life of social class. You would think this is just about culture, but our, the representation of culture that we see in these schools is very much shaped by social class. And this is part of the political narrative that we miss. The particular cohorts of immigrants that go to the US and the UK is very much shaped by state immigration policy. So let me give you another example. In the United States in the 1920s, when this narrative about Black Caribbeans being this high achieving group developed, that was because the United States required that West Indian or Caribbean immigrants coming into the United States, it was part of immigration policy that they had to have high English language proficiency, which then became a code or a proxy for thinking through recruiting the middle classes and the elites. But we're not paying attention to this class dimension of the immigration policy. Instead, they are received in the United States and represented as simply being of a better cultural stock used to sort of mobilize, mobilize, and in some cases, lambast African-Americans moving in from the South to say that they needed to work harder, right? Mm -hmm. When in fact, it's class resources. Immigration research shows that there's nothing different between movers from Chicago to New York City and movers from New York, from Jamaica to New York City. They are motivated and they have the class resources to sort of uh, uh, guide their aspirations as it were. Social class plays a profound role in shaping the representations of culture. And these are some of the nuances that we miss. And that's why it feels urgent for me to name and theorize the culture trap in this way, not only for the sake of Black Caribbean students and not only for the sake of Black youth, though that is where the, my heart lies and that's where the center of my work lies, but so that we recognize how this is used across ethno-racial lines, how we are pitted against one another, all the while leaving white supremacy intact. Mm. That's powerful. Okay, so now I have a two-part question for you, if that's all right. So first, can you just talk about the epiphany of that of that moment around the, this language of movers in particular, right? So I don't know if everyone here knows how we met. I, I hit you up when I was a college student because uh, I wanted to apply for the Marshall and nobody would share their application materials with me but you. So thank you, brother, for that. I really mm -hmm. appreciate it. And I remember when we first met, you really had already the kind of fundamental materials for this project. And you were saying that you were seeing these, this kind of first mover phenomenon, right? Where these large black populations in Britain, in the US were being stigmatized, right? Can you talk a bit about that kind of epiphanic moment? That's the one thing I wanna hear. Ooh. And the second question is, uh, it's a bit more stylistic, right? I wanna talk to you about process. There's this thing you do that I love, man, at the level of the writing itself, which is that you'll set up these, these oppositions, right? So you talk a bit about, for example, uh, deference and defiance, right? That that's one sort of couplet you have. You talk about stereotype threat and stereotype promise, right? And you set up these beautiful kind of divisions throughout the book. And I keep expecting a triangulation Well, you'll say, but I have this specialized term that fixes that, but you don't do that in the mm -hmm. book. So I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about that approach, because it's interesting to me. I feel like a lot of what you do with those oppositions is you just offer details. You say, well, actually it's much messier and the culture trap itself is so dynamic that I can't just give you this kind of neat synthesis, but here's what the people on the ground are saying. So can you talk about that? And maybe those things are connected. Like maybe the epiphanic moment just came from you being in kind of fellowship with these folks, but I yeah. wanted to hear a bit just as a reader about that. Thank you for those questions, Josh. They, the two are related, but for the purposes of precision, I'll try to treat them separately. Um, so I met you shortly after I had this epiphany and I, I'm pretty forthright about it in the book. I had no intention of studying sociology in graduate school. <laughs> That's not why I went to graduate school. Um, and when I met Miss Bell, 
for me, I felt as though I had a deep, what I call diaspora dilemma. And I remember leafing through my range of sociology textbooks, history textbooks, black studies books, comparative and international education books, talking with a whole host of scholars and leaders and saying, somebody must have figured this out already. Somebody must have written about this. And as I realized, no one had. It felt like a, a pressing, urgent uh, need to do so. Um, the real epiphany here was that how context can shape what movers encounter, right? And so part of what I think about in the book is that there's something significant that happens to the first cohort of Blacks to move into these imperial nation states, albeit under different conditions. So for African-Americans forcibly brought to the United States, so a different kind of movement there. And Black Caribbeans to the UK um, voluntarily going to the UK context. Um, but despite differences in the sort of patterns of their movement, both in both contexts, they represent the first large cohort of Blacks to enter the nation states. Again, albeit under different conditions. Um, I draw on the work of literary scholar Joan Anim Ado to theorize, and I'm hoping this will be a paper in the future, that though the experiences of African-Americans in the US is certainly very different from the experiences of Black Caribbeans in the UK, their structural positioning as a, um, a, a long-standing, uh, see really stigmatized minority in each of these national contexts, um, they're, they're what I call, or what she refers to as Black Caribbeans as the signifying minority. And I'm th I think that has traction across the Atlantic. It's not simply Black Caribbeans. African-Americans constitute the signifying minority too, because they represent for the nation state, it's wrestling with, it's reckoning with the meaning of race as part of the nation. Mm. And th this signification um, to draw on Stuart Hall's work persists over time. And so for me, that was an epiphany, both theoretically and empirically. What's, what is more is that the connections across the two was relevant for public politics. So when we think about how do we activate community groups, how we activate across lines of, of ethnicity, in order to advance sort of uh, the cause of all black children in education, it's resisting the state's attempt to divide us without recognizing the policies that they've used to do so, to sort of shape this narrative about how it's the culture that makes one group, not a model minority as the political scientist Christina Greer um, rebuts, but as an elevated black minority. What are the conditions that make that so? And if we're cognizant of that, can we be mindful of how we're all then susceptible to being what the sociologist um, uh, Phil Kassinitz regards to as fading to black? When does the ethnicity stop? When you move past the first, the immigrant cohort and the second gen, what happens then? We then have to think differently about, again, what the political scientist uh, Michael Dawson calls our linked fate. That for me was a political epiphany. And it wasn't just about what was going on in the United States. It wasn't just about what was going on in Britain. The two were connected. Mm -hmm. Relatedly, a big epiphany for me was that, and I say this um, flat-footedly, um, and it pushes against much of what immigration studies research has done. I argue clearly in this work that you cannot understand any Caribbean immigrant in London or New York City, or frankly, any immigrant in any whole society without understanding their perceptions of the whole society from the homeland. What this means is that you no longer have, no longer have a two-way analysis here where you can only look at them in London and New York. You must treat their homelands and the histories of those homelands carefully in order to understand the imaginaries immigrants build about what schooling would be like even before they step on London um, or New York City shores, right? Um, I could go on and on about those, but those are the, the key epiphanies for me and you, we met shortly after I had those epiphanies. Um, in relation to style, yes, I do set up quite intentionally. I try to be delicate um, in the dance of the sort of these oppositions to say, they don't work. <laughs> they don't That's give right. us all of what we need and we can't rest there. This is what the narrative suggests. And I want to offer attribution to um, bodies of scholarship that have really advanced our thinking. So all the, 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 the points you lifted, about, lifted up about stereotype threat versus stereotype promise, for instance, as just one example. There are a whole host of scholars who've done this work, sociologists, anthropologists. Um, but what I was seeing was something um, different. I, I would 
say that the culture trap for me felt like the core contribution because what it was advancing was a, a unifying conceptual frame where we get to see how um, stereotype threat is often in relation to stereotype promise, how the elevation of one minority group is necessarily contingent on the stigmatization of the other. But what we've often done is theorize them separately. What I want to do with the culture trap is to help us understand theoretically and empirically how the two are related and more than that, how it shapes how young people experience it in everyday social life. Mm -hmm. I'll pause there. I'm happy to elaborate, but um, that's uh, part of why there was no need to sort of reconcile these oppositions. They, they formed the dominant public narrative, but I wanted to offer both analytically and theoretically a much more supple, nuanced reading, along with a new conceptual approach for thinking about what was really at stake here beyond these binaries. No, and that, that plays beautifully in the book, and I think that's legible. I mean, part of what, and I love too that you brought in the kind of imaginaries from the homeland. There's this moment in the book where you talk about lean on me and, and the, <laughs> the you know, U.S. film industry is kind of public pedagogy, right? People are saying those schools are terrible, right? In New York. And then you clarify, well, that was not in New York. This is New Jersey. It's like, brother, it's the same thing to me, right? This kind of flattening that happens. So one more last thing on this before we pivot to q and I know we have to. If you could just talk briefly about voice and mm. why it matters to you. I mean, you brought in that beautiful video. Right. You said it was inspired by your son's voice, by Jeremiah sort of saying, well, I want to share this with more people, Dad. Can we maybe broaden the voice a little bit, open up the voice a little bit? Why was that so important for you, both with the use of Patois in this book, with the use of this constellation of different scholars? Why did you want to have such a capacious voice for this particular book at this particular time? Yeah, um, I, I so appreciate that question. Um, uh, permit me to speak forthrightly. I, I it was clear to me that I had to write this book for tenure, right? <laughs> okay, let's get to it. I had to write this book for tenure, but it was always clear that this was a project for my people. Mm -hmm. Always. Relatedly, it meant that I had to reconcile the academic expectations to sort of um, layer it with sort of theory, but I didn't want it to be a, a heady book that the very people who I spent time with couldn't, you know, I didn't want to layer it with sort of dense, turgid prose that they couldn't possibly understand. Even the title of the book itself, I went through several negotiations back with families like, does this make sense to you? Right? Because that was really important in terms of voice. So voice wasn't just about documenting their stories on the page. It was about them being part of the political process shaping this work. Um, in relation to language, that was another key dimension that I had to negotiate in the process, right? We would often just represent young people's voices and do the English translation because I'm speaking to two, you know, English speaking audiences, but I couldn't write this book without having these parents speak the way they speak without recognizing, which immigration studies often ignores, that second generation young people speak Patois sometimes even better than me. But immigration studies research sort of suggests that they don't have the same cultural retention, as it were. And I wanted to trouble that, but without making it an explicit argument, I wanted to show you with the language and the voice that they're able to do this. Finally, um, in relation to voice, um, it felt really crucial to me um, that I wasn't looking at young people in isolation, but that I was understanding their cultural context and the range of social actors they negotiate with in order to live out their experiences in schools. And so I pay attention to parents' voices, teachers' voices, students' voices. Why? Because all, these constituencies in particular are often drowned out in the political discussion about what is required for education reform and educational change. You know, the young people will describe what they're experiencing in schools, and they would say, my teacher is not listening to me. The parents would say, the, the teacher is not listening to me, or the young people say, my parent isn't listening to me. And the uh, teachers themselves would say, well, the district officials are not listening to me. What would happen if we brought all their voices in the same space, in the same work, in the same book? And that really happens in my field, sociology of education. You're often focusing on one voice or one constituency, but there's power in understanding the relationship between these. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that voice is to marshal their political power mm -hmm. so that they hear one another and shoot and recognize the inequalities that exist and find, I suppose, the, the gusto to work together across lines of difference, to challenge educational policy as we know it, cultural narratives as they're promulgated, but ultimately to pursue change and the full flourishing of Black children and young people. It's beautiful, brother. Okay. May I call on some people in the audience? Um, Rihanna.
Brianna, there we go. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. It wouldn't let me unmute myself. <laughs> um, thank you all. Thank you so much. That was really, really lovely and um, loving the voice, loving all the elements. So I just wanted to offer something and then ask this a question. So you mentioned a lot of disciplines. You skipped right on over your cousins in psychology. We've got a lot to say about what you've been talking about. So happy to offer some resources yes. or some constructs that might be helpful there. So happy to follow up with you. I think the, the second thing that I want to ask about, and it follows up really nicely with what you were just sharing. And again, I want to emphasize my excitement over Black children and their resilience, their, their beauty and splendor shining through your whole project. I want to get to the idea of the trap. So when we talk a lot, especially in hip hop, like lyrics around what the trap is, and it's just that the trap, like people come in and they are not able to get out. So this question of is the culture trap something that is put on, embedded, and, and then unable to be gotten out of by these young people, even if they are trying to resist against it and push ahead? Or is it something that we just need to be mindful of as they're able to then transition out of? So I'm just, I'm wondering what the trap might even limit these young people to do if we're using that term. And, and maybe not even, maybe we don't need to focus on that, but I just wonder what what, with what we know of the trap being something that people can't get out of, what that means with respect to your goal of this being something that young people are able to push back against. Sure, thank you so much for, for the question. Um, first, I do engage some elements of, of social psychology in particular, um, citing and engaging the work of God Steele is, uh, feels absolutely relevant. Um, and his work has been a touchstone in both psychology, sociology, history, anthropology. Um, and so that's there. Part of why I was really excited about being in dialogue with um, with Josh, um, and I make this clear in the book, is that the actual resources I draw on from the sort of analytical innovation come from Black studies, come from this capacious field that is richly interdisciplinary, and it certainly includes the contributions of psychology to the trap. Um, what I found is that even in young people's desires to escape the culture trap, as it were, it often relied on them trapping another group in it. That is the danger and the real trick of the trap, right? But the reason this happened, I think at least, is that they weren't often asked cognizant of the sort of political ramifications of trapping another group, right? What happens when we have what happens when we start teaching black studies in secondary schools and in middle schools, and we teach this sort of capacious history about how different groups have been pitted against one another? How might that reshape how young people respond to one another in schools? So I'm, I wanna be clear, noting the culture trap, it's important for transforming dispositions, teacher and student dispositions, but relatedly, I also think about the structural rearrangements necessary to make this education sustainable and for young people to experience it earlier so they can be even more savvy in calling out what they encounter in schools. Does that make sense? Sometimes students are recognizing on their own, but they're not looking at the aggregate. I certainly didn't have that viewpoint before becoming a sociologist, but that's why we have to name the culture trap for what it is and also think through the range of structural re rearrangements necessary to make that awareness sustainable for all Black children and young people in schools. Thank you. Um, Pierre Christophe had a question, and then we'll move on to Damaris Mohamed. Yeah, yeah. can you guys, uh, see me, hear me? OK, great. Uh, uh, congratulations for this uh, presentation and this uh, very necessary uh, project. Um, I, so I'm French um, from West Indies, from West Africa, Cameroon and Chad, and I'm familiar with a French sociologist called Pierre Bourdieu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess you're familiar about him. And I think what is interesting in the in the work that Pierre Bourdieu did on social reproduction, looking at class, how students from working class background are able to achieve you know, the different patterns, the different strategies that are put in place by people from more privileged classes to ensure that the kids will be able, the children will be able to achieve the same social status than them afterwards. So what you see ultimately is that it's very much a matter of class. And when we say people are from West Indies, I think it doesn't tell much about the family stories, how these people were able to come. And I think that's something when you touch upon, when you mentioned that actually the ones that were coming in the US were often upper middle class. I think I was listening to the story of this American writer uh, from, the, from Jamaica, actually, um, the guy that wrote the book Outliers. Um, famous psychology. Yeah. Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, Malcolm Gladwell, exactly. And he was talking about his family story and the fact that, yes, he was from Jamaica, but his family historically were 
from upper class. You know, they were colored, you know. So it was very much giving kind of historical context. When, when you say people are from Jamaica, it doesn't say much about the journey. Another thing as well, when you were mentioning about that aspect, it was making me think about the challenge that exists right now in South Africa with migrants from West Africa yes. going to South Africa. Mm -hmm. And the argument that is being posed by the rest of society is to say, look, you can see these migrants are able to come to South Africa, they see opportunities, and they're able to become very successful. A lot of them actually come from Nigeria, and this creates a resentment from the Black South African population against the Nigerians. And so, like you were saying about this thing of pitting one minority against the other, this is essentially what is happening in South Africa. And I think what people miss when we speak about migration, often the people that are able to migrate are often middle class, sometimes upper middle class, but even if they're not middle class per se, there is a level of resources and agency that one needs to have to be able to uproot himself, leave his family behind and go to another's place. So this in itself, this is not common to everybody. Um, and, and I think as well, there's this other aspect of when you are, for example, in the US in particular, right? When you are from generation and you are the descendant of enslaved people, in the land. So it means the legacy of trauma, of trauma, uh, you know, the kind of transgenerational trauma and the structural and legal framework around in order to really keep a population, um, you know, in a position of oppression, the whole system was shaped around that. So there is, it's easier for me coming as a migrant in the US to see opportunities and activate them than for a black American, I would say in that context, because, you know, just being black is not enough you know you have to really consider you know the the historical context in which people have to move and sometimes these things are not visible because they're they're part of the you know the way that the society um is organized with access to opportunities and so forth so my questions because there's a question so what was your investigation what was the framework that we use you use in order to do the comparison between the west indian kids in the uk uh and in the us Thank you. Well, uh, Pierre Christophe, uh, thank you so much. Very quickly, because I note a number of hands and I want to engage with as many people as possible. Um, and so um, this book is based on 18 months of comparative work, um, archival research in London and New York City, um, uh, over 184 in-depth interviews, focus group and in-depth interviews of Black Caribbean young people, in particular, second generation Black Caribbean young people, their teachers and their parents. So I'm an ethnographer by training and I'm interested in the lived experiences, the everyday experiences of these um, that young people have in schools. Um, you brought up, I'll make two quick comments. You brought up Pierre Bourdieu, and it's so funny you do that because the two core theoreticians I'm engaging with in the work are Pierre Bourdieu and Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall, I think for obvious reasons um, in relation to this work, but for Pierre Bourdieu, you can't be anywhere in Europe and study sociology and them not celebrate him. It's it's like this ongoing lionization of this man that meaningful though his work be, but oftentimes it's argued that we can reduce racial, reduce our understandings of racial inequality to simply social class. And I actively push back against that in my work or what I see in the UK context as this sort of or what the sociologist Bedelia Richards calls this class-based mass narrative like it all comes down to social class the reason I bring Pierre Bourdieu and Stuart Hall into conversations is that Bourdieu did not pay very much attention to race um, and social class you know P Stuart Hall said race is the modality through which class is lived so if you want to understand how class is actually working you have to pay attention to race but we tend not to wish to do that Relatedly, though Stuart Hall theorized um, the relationship between racial class, he did not focus on it in relation to schools in the way Bourdieu did. So each gives me something else that the other didn't have, but it's to offer like a fundamental, a, a richer treatment on the relationship between race and class in the context of schools. And finally, though I found that black middle-class students were the ones who were disproportionately high achieving in both London and New York City schools, the black Caribbean students, I want to be really clear that this isn't to suggest that black middle-class students have some secret sauce either in relation to success. I just want to make sure that it's because this, this will go on record. I just want to be crystal clear. The reason black middle-class students are able to do well in schools is because schools are middle-class institutions ordered to recognize and reward the middle classes. That was a fundamental part of what Bourdieu was theorizing. Right. And so it feels really important to state on the record that there are highly aspirational immigrants who are working class and students who are working class who push through to success, but encounter tremendous barriers in the process of doing so. And there's a greater degree of ease often um, in to, to, in, to invoke um, Bourdieu in relation to the middle classes um, on both sides of the Atlantic. I hope that's useful and I look forward to being in further conversation. But I see Damaris, Mohammed, and Ashley and would just love to hear your questions and I'll do my best to respond quickly. 
Jeanette. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wallace. Um, particularly your last comment. I, I'm I'm very interested. Um, first of all, I'm I'm a poet. Um, um, but I have been a public school educator, um, and I'm very interested in the ways economic technologies, whether it's social economic class of an individual family or public funding, interacts and negotiates public policy. I'm always watching for that. And so um, I want to thank you for... Um, evoking a question um, or your statements about public policy, because I'm interested in thinking about how your theories regarding the culture trap um, amplify how we see race and class intersecting um, in the ways that we um, treat our children and um, use public policy as an equalizer, right? So I, I, I'm 100% with you that students that do better in public schools often have resources, even if they don't suffer from a um, poverty of opportunity, right? So we often talk about middle-class students having resources that are economic, but they also have, like you were just speaking about, the um, a, a type of wealth of opportunities there may have never been a time in their life when they hadn't considered higher education, right? Or they have professional parents. So I'm interested in thinking, or you're brainstorming about, I don't know if you address it in the book, mm -hmm. how, will, how will we address these policy issues? I know it can be addressed locally. There's a complication of states in the United States as far as policy, but I'm very interested, how do we start to have, um, this conversation on a global level that that impacts um, the way the legacy of colonialism continues to destroy public education systems as a as an equalizer. Thank you so much for the question, Damaris, and I'll do my best. Sorry, to be that was confusing. No, no, I think I understand um, the heart of the question. Um, and 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 to to answer it, I think I have to lift up some examples from the ethnography. So what I found is that the black Caribbean middle class students who are the, the middle class students in, across ethnic lines, racial lines in the UK who are faring well were not simply doing well in schools and having parents who had been university educated. They also had access to um, what they call tuition in the UK. So this is separate schooling, an extra school they go to after school. And the students, the working class students, were cognizant of this. Their parents were paying extra fees for them to be tutored outside of schools. And so amidst the collapse around state education, as it's called in the UK, or public education, as we call it in the US, middle-class parents are marshalling their resources, even when they send their kids to public schools, to provide them with supplementary resources. And this often goes unaccounted for, even as we continue to call education the equalizer. Mm -hmm. The great equalizer. For me, it's recognizing both the in school and out of school resources that are relevant and how all students need access to them. And so it therefore means this is an attempt to in a moment where it could be, you could easily divide the middle classes or the black middle classes from the black working classes. I'm saying, no, all our students need access to these resources, every last one of them. And where they don't have um, them or can't afford them, the state ought to provide, right? They, we ought to mobilize. And black communities have been doing this for quite some time through churches and community-based spaces to provide what the state would not. And so for me, it's a two-pronged um, approach. It's about black political unity in relation to educational policy across the lines of ethnicity and social class to make sure that all our children and young people have access to those resources. But it's also about our own ingenuity and creativity, our own community-based spaces where we um, create schools that are open through um, our churches, our mosques, our synagogues, open to all our children and young people. Um, that's at least my first part of the answer. The transnational portion is one I'm working on as an organizer. I see things on both sides of the Atlantic and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if they knew what was going on over here. That's what I hope my future work um, underscores moving forward, but I hope that at least um, uh, addresses an element of the question that you posed, Damaris. Yes, I look forward to your future theories. I'm very interested in that. Thank you. Mohammed, thank you. Oh, I'm on mute. Uh, thank you so much for that breakdown. As a social worker, there, I'm hearing a lot of theories, but then also a lot of lived realities and working with youth. 
Um, I had one question that was more on the work and the second one was a request, but let me get through my first question. Uh, as a West African immigrant who has lived in Europe and now currently living in Boston here, I just had the question about how do we as adults and educators uh, recognize these traps that we maybe have embodied ourselves, um, especially as we work with teens that come from diverse backgrounds. Um, yeah, that's something I'm always trying to be very cautious about. Uh, I think in one of the examples you were giving about the teacher who herself was saying something that you caught, you were like, oh, what's that? So that's the first one. Uh, and then the second thing I wanted to ask was, uh, I work for Pride Boston, which is a, a journalism and, and a writing program for teens here in Boston. I would love to have one of our teen reporters actually have a sit down with you or call. Um, so have a breakdown of the thesis of your book, because uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking about, okay, how do you get this to a younger audience? just for them to read and learn about the strategies of solidarity they can already enhance at this young age. Uh, so those were my uh, two questions. Sure, very quickly to the second, yes, very happy to be in dialogue. Um, and to the first question, um, there's so many answers to that, but one I think that is really crucial in both London and New York City is the attention we pay to national political histories. Oftentimes, Black immigrants, when we arrive into a new country context, we're not as intimately or analytically familiar with those um, political economic histories that have shaped the experiences of Black people who were there before us, right? And that is part of the limit. This is part of why I think Black studies as a, um, a, a feature of, of, I mean, we can question whether or not you know, what the state education system might do with it. But that's why this debate about banning books and, you know, um, uh, critical race theory or more broadly ethnic studies in schools, that's why it is so urgent. It's an opportunity to shape these ideas to engender solidarity across lines of difference and to do so not when students get to university, but to do so much earlier. Black studies as an educational project was never, it didn't start out, um, it wasn't, it was institutionalized um, in, in universities, but it started out as a grassroots political project that was accessible to everyday people in community-based spaces. And I think that ought to be part of it. What is more, that public education was always a clear part of its aims. And I think we have to return to that, right? By making sure that all young people at the primary and secondary level have access to, to um, these narratives of history um, uh, for African-Americans in particular in the United States, that we understand the full weight um, of both the, the challenges of white supremacy they encounter and their deep and profound resistance to it. And similarly in the UK context, that the black arts movement in the UK, the black supplementary school movements, things that we're often taking for granted in the UK context, that black Africans and those who've come after them are deeply acquainted with these histories. Why? Not for its own intellectual state, it engenders political solidarity, right? That's really important. So I hope that answers your questions, Mohammed. Okay, final question from Ashley. Hi, hi, Daron. Thank yeah. you so much for your compelling talk and your dope book. Um, <laughs> I, when I was reading your book, I was especially struck by how it was not only an illuminating ethnography, but it was also a rigorous and interesting and important history. So thank you for that. Um, it's something I aspire to in my work. Um, when I was reading, one of the questions, I had many questions, mm -hmm. but one that I was left with toward the end of the book was that you express that um, you had distinct experiences and observations when it came to Black girls, and also mm -hmm. your interactions and relationships with Black girls was different. Yes. Um, and I wanted to ask you more if you could talk about Black girls and what we can learn from what you experienced. Oh, Ashley, I'm I'm so appreciative of that question and so excited about um, your work and all it will continue to contribute to the field of sociology. I mentioned um, in during the discussion with with Josh that there are three distinctive, maybe not have named them explicitly, but there are three distinct cultural strategies that Black Caribbean young people on both sides of the Atlantic de deploy in pursuit of success. The first is distinctiveness, the second is deference, and the third is defiance. Let me comment on deference because that for me was perhaps the most eye-opening portion of the work. 
deferences, this belief, this idea that your good behavior and comportment, how you dress, how you speak, can assist you in success or can aid your success. What I found in that context is that while deference was, um, while young people in London and New York City engaged deference as a strategy for success, it was a profoundly gendered strategy. The Black Caribbean boys on both sides of the Atlantic um, practice what I call complementary deference or deference for the sake of receiving praise. They would, for simple things like showing up to class on time, raising their hands, sitting properly and not having loud outbursts, these boys were praised for what the girls regarded as basic behavior. Black girls in both London and New York City, these Black Caribbean girls, um, were not praised for their behavior. They could only experience, or they often only experience praise based on high achievement. They practice what I call compulsory deference. They're supposed to be deferential. They're girls. And these girls were so acutely aware of this gendered formula. And it really brought thing, my analysis to a head because usually it's about what's different. And in this book, I'm saying, yes, there, there are things that are different, but what the Black Caribbean girls in London and the Black Caribbean girls in New York are experiencing are actually quite similar. What the Black Caribbean boys in London and the Black Caribbean boys in New York are experiencing is similar. And that has to do with global gendered regimes of power playing out in these global cities that we ought to be mindful of. Critically, what I argue in um, the fifth chapter and in the conclusion is that we have to resist the political narrative that suggests we, can, we need to prioritize boys' education or Black boys' education over and against Black girls' education that we need to have this distinct policy formula and we have them in the US and UK my brother's keeper in 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 the um in the US um and Boris Johnson had a fairly similar program in London um supporting black boys and that's important that is important but where our political solidarity often stops is recognizing how the kinds and quality of supports Black girls need in order to fear even better or to pay attention to the fact that Black girls are often suspended at higher rates than their white female counterparts or to pay attention to the fact that the Black Caribbean girls are often not achieving, they're achieving more than Black Caribbean boys, but often not as much as their white female counterparts. They too need that quality support. But it's the political narrative that suggests we ought to prioritize boys, that teachers come into class with saying, let me support these boys in the best way I can. And what they're doing, I note, is that they're actually promoting low behavioral expectation for these boys. In an, even while they're praising them and seeking to support them, the girls don't get, the black girls don't get that kind of praise. It is only through their hard work and um, achievement that they're able to um, acquire praise. I wish I could say to you, Ashley, that I had this you know, savvy, political savvy and analytical and theoretical awareness of exactly what was playing out. But as I'm pretty honest about in the book, I didn't even see it myself. In the interviews, these Black girls in both London and New York City took me to task. How could you not see it? Many, some would ask me. I make it plain in the book. They really challenge me. Why? Because I too had benefited from these logics that would praise boys, even in my own encounter in secondary school, for basic behavior. Yes, you're right. When I came to class on time, I got praise. I, I was rewarded in ways that my female counterparts didn't. But it took me a very long time to recognize it. And it has to do with the limits of my own positionality as a Black man. But at the heart of this, Ashley, is that in both London and New York City, and in fact, I would argue globally, we have to resist the urge to think that we only need to prioritize Black boys. Important though that be, we have to think about the relationship between supports for Black boys and Black girls. And it's not a zero-sum game, right? Um, that's what they want us to think that needs to be the case. But those of us who are benefiting from the sort of push around Black boys' education ought to also advocate with greater gusto, I would suggest, for the support and education of Black girls. Thank you, a very important point. Thank you, Daran and Joshua for a very profound, the important conversation. Thank you, audience members, and please get this wonderful book. Thank you all so much. Um, so delighted to be here with you all. I will share the video that I shared with you all before in the chat so you can access it. Um, all kudos to Jeremiah. <laughs>